So this is uh, the history of the RCA Studio 2 and uh, the Fred hardware that it comes from. But uh, you know, I guess we'll start with introductions. Uh, want to go first? Uh, hi, how's the level on the mic? You good? All right, great. Um, so I'm Florencia Pieri. I am a historian of technology, and I have to say I feel very um, like an imposter here because I don't play very many video games. I think I've played more video games in the past like 24 hours here than I have in my life. Um, but I am a curator at the Sarnoff Collection, which is a history of communication technology museum where we have, among other things, a lot of early prototype hardware for things like the Studio 2. Uh, and I'm Kevin Bunch, uh, sort of a video game historian. I am the person behind the Atari Archive YouTube channel, which is sort of digging into the history of early video games. Uh, and part of that led me to uh, do a lot of digging into the RCA Studio 2. So uh, who here is familiar with the RCA Studio 2? That's a lot more people than I expected. Uh, how many people have actually played with one? That's more, that's more what I was expecting there. Uh, so it's a system that came out in February 1977. It was on the market for about a year. It was not terribly successful, and it's not terribly well-remembered even today. Uh, most people know that it's not very good. Like, the games are kind of let's see, The controls, as you can see, are just a pair of keypads that are built into the system. It's a, it's a really weird machine, uh, but what sort of makes it interesting is that the origins of it go all the way back to 1970, which makes it probably the longest development time of any of these early game consoles. Uh, so that's before even uh, home computers were coming along, before the first microprocessors. Uh, so, but it, it struggled on the market and to sort of get an idea of so the issues it faced, uh, you kind of want to get an idea of uh, where RCA was at, you know, coming into the 70s and through the decade. All right. And that's, uh, that's my bit. So where was RCA in all of this? RCA, for uh, probably the younger people in the room that might not have heard of it, was the Radio Corporation of America. And in the 50s and 60s, they were an absolute powerhouse. Uh, they were pioneers in radio broadcasting and black and white television. They started the National Broadcasting Corporation, or NBC. And they manufactured the televisions, radios, phonographs, graph, graph, gas ranges, not grass ranges, air conditioners, tape recorders that were starting to fill American homes. Um, but they didn't necessarily make a lot of computers and a lot of computer things. But they did, as we'll see, do some of that. So they had started out actually in 1919 as a company designed mainly for sending wireless telegraphs. And it had grown by the 1950s into a huge behemoth thanks to a couple of factors. Um, first, uh, they engaged in what can charitably be called some unsavory business practices. And I'll give you a few fun examples. Uh, in the early part of the century, RCA and NBC threw their weight around in hearings held by the Federal Radio Com uh, Commission and the la later the Federal Communication Commission to keep FM radio off the usable radio spectrum just because they didn't hold the patents on the technology, not because AM was any better, because it's not. Um, and when a uh, FM became too useful to ignore, RCA simply infringed on the patent held by uh, Edwin Armstrong, who had a lot of patents on this, figuring that it had the resources to wait out a lawsuit. And they were right. Armstrong committed suicide before the courts ultimately ruled in his favor, but not before RCA had made a pretty penny on the sale of FM receivers. Something very similar happened to Philo Farnsworth, the inventor of television. After Farnsworth refused to sell his patents, RCA simply used them anyway without paying for them. Farnsworth eventually again won his lawsuit, but he was financially ruined uh, by it. And I'll give you one last example, and I swear it's relevant, even though it's not about computers. Um, when the rival broadcasting company CBS came out with the color television system and had their system ratified by the FCC, RCA actually sued the FCC, taking this case all the way to the Supreme Court in order to block that rival system, not primarily out of any concern for the consumer, but because it would negatively affect RCA's bottom line. They won that case too. 
So RCA, it's safe to say, was used to coming out on top, which, what, which is what makes their computer division fiasco so remarkable. So throughout all of this, Throughout all of this was uh, this dude, David Sarnoff, who had been with RCA since it was formed after a post-World War I breakup of the American Marconi Company. He was first the general manager, then the president, and eventually the chairman of the board. And uh, Sarnoff, more than anyone else, really shaped RCA, but he did more than just encourage the infringement of intellectual property. Um, he might not have been an engineer or a scientist or a person who made things, but he did have a lot of really good ideas of what he thought would be great products. Uh, for some things, he was remarkably prescient. In the 19-teens, for example, he thought that the average consumer would want to buy what he called a radio music box, and he turned out to be quite right. People bought radios. Um, same with the logic of a broadcasting company. He also set, had some other good ideas, all electronic air conditioning, TV screens so flat they could lie on the wall like a picture frame, or wristwatches with built-in radios. All of these he sort of dreamed up in the 1920s and 30s. And a lot of his predictions eventually did come true. We have flat screen television and smartwatches. Uh, some things like his prediction that high school biology labs would be equipped with electron microscopes, which RCA also made, might still come true. But he wasn't a good person to look, for, to, look to for ideas about computers. Uh, in the late 1960s, uh, for example, he wrote a small pamphlet about the social impact of computers, but nowhere in it did he envision anything beyond the hulking, Brobdingnagian mainframes of the era. Still, it was his spirit of innovation that led RCA to enter the computer business, even if, our, if, even if Sarnoff himself was, to put it mildly, not a computer person. He just thought that there was money to be made in computers and by gosh, RCA was going to make that money. And judging from their past successes, it seems like it should have been a great success. RCA had actually been making computer-related things since the mid-1940s, including uh, this thing. This is a Selectron. It's a high-speed memory vacuum tube from back in the day when vacuum tubes, uh, when computers were made with vacuum tubes. They also held an early patent for core memory, uh, but the company really went into the computer business in 1955, along with quite a few other companies that made consumer electronics. C companies like General Electric, Raytheon, which, believe it or not, was originally a refrigerator company, Honeywell, Bendix, and Philco. And it seemed like these companies were a perfect fit to make computers, because they were already creating large electronic devices. I mean, RCA was churning out, not many, but still churning out electron microscopes. They could easily do some computers as well. RCA was the third largest manufacturing firm in the country, and in 1955, it had annual sales of almost $1 billion, which was huge compared to what IBM was pulling in that year, something like $200 million. So RCA, like General Electric, thought they were going to do just fine with computers and decided to compete uh, with IBM. So RCA, in November of 1955, launched the Bismac. There's the Bismac. Uh, 20,000 square foot vacuum tube type computer that was meant for business and data processing. It wasn't necessarily a commercial success, especially since it was competing with faster, cheaper, and simpler transistor-based computers like the IBM 700, but still in 1955 they had quite a few uh, customers. Uh, RCA then went in for their own transistorized computers, the 301 and then the 501, and while these computers sold moderately well, consumers were frustrated by the poor design of their peripherals, so it ultimately didn't capture much of the market, at least it didn't manage to make IBM go away altogether, especially not after the 1964 unveiling of IBM System 360, a fully compatible family of computers and peripherals. So when RCA first heard murmurs about the System 360, they were worried. So the 501 was okay, but it sounded like the 360 would be better. Uh, so RCA decided on a new strategy. Instead of trying to figure out computers on their own, they were basically going to stick to IBM like a burr on a dog. They decided that instead of trying to come up with this whole new system, they were just going to be 
they were just going to produce IBM compatible computers and peripherals, and that was going to be the Spectrum 70 series, Spectra 70 rather. Again, mainframe, uh, the, um, the women computer there in the corner um, is feeding the machine. Um, and the reason why this was a success was that the System 360 project was just too big to be kept secret. All of the manuals were publicly available, so learning how the machine worked wasn't actually terribly hard. Um, since it was so big, IBM had to share a lot of information about it, and it was powerless from uh, stopping anybody from building a clone. And that's actually how the Soviet Union got their computer program started. They copied the System 360. So this Spectra 70 series was unveiled in 1964, and the computers were uh, both compa were compatible with the System 360, and really more importantly, they cost way less than the 360, making them very attractive to consumers. Um, the reason why was because they didn't have to do any of the design work, they just had to copy whatever IBM did. Um, and it was a risky strategy, but it paid off really, really well in the short term for RCA. They were making bank selling these Spectra 70s. Um, they, since they didn't bear the cost of creating them. And the Spectra 70s were actually more attractive for a while than the 360 uh, because they used things like integrated circuits, which hadn't been perfected when IBM started to design the System 360. And things were going great until IBM struck back with the System 370 in 1970. So RCA tried to do the exact same thing, just copy everything that the System 370 did uh, to come up with another compatible system. But in the end, RCA had basically too many fingers in too many pies, or maybe not enough fingers in too many pies. Um, a lot of things were happening. In 1970, Sarnoff was replaced as chairman of the board with his far less capable son, Robert Sarnoff, and uh, Sarnoff Jr decided that the way to go was diversification and licensing of the RCA name. RCA brought up, bought up Hertz Rent-A-Car, Tyson Foods, Random House Publishing, and a bunch of other companies that they probably didn't have any business being in. In all that shuffle, the computer division was unable to compete with IBM System 370. It didn't have the resources, and it didn't have um, you know, upper management's uh, sort of backing. They were more interested in making money off of Hertz or something like that. So RCA decided to sell their computer division, taking a financial hit of $490 million, uh, the largest suffered by any American company up until that time. Uh, but don't, don't worry, that, um, that record would be beat in a few short years. If we have time, we'll talk about that. Um, so when they uh, shuttered their computer division, they lost a bunch of money. They were only able to sell part of their division to Sperry Univac for a paltry um, $70 million. When GE sold their computer division, they got something like $300 million off of it. So not great for RCA. And to give you an idea of sort of how large and unwieldy the company was at that time, I'd like to share a story that came from an oral history interview uh, that Kevin took of Paul Russo, who was an engineer who worked on uh, the Studio 2 project, but who started out at RCA Labs uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, working for the computer division. So this is his quotation. I got to RCA after having just finished my PhD at Berkeley in computer science. A bunch of us were in the mainframe group looking at, a com looking at computer architecture and various other things. A few months later, I went into the office on a Saturday to catch up on some things. On the way, I picked up the New York Times, and I'm walking into RCA Labs in Princeton, and I read the headline, RCA exits mainframe business. And I said, oh shit, what the hell am I going in for? And so that Monday, we're all wondering what the hell happens. So one of the folks who worked alongside Paul Russo, who was hired first to work on the Bismack project, was Joseph Weisbecker, a guy who really, really wanted to be a magician, but being a magician is not a very solid career choice, so he settled on the more stable job of computer engineer. Early on in life, he had read Edmund Berkeley's 1949 Giant Brains or Machines That Think, the first popular book on electronic computers, and he was hooked. He thought that the computers would be the future, but not the big hulking mainframes that he had initially been hired to work on, but smaller personal devices that you could use for things like playing games, another passion of his. So throughout his life, so basically he loved games, 
Throughout his life, he patented dozens of paper and plastic games, most of which still exist at the Sarnoff collection, and some of which were actually manufactured. Things like, oh, oops, sorry, there's, there's Weizbecker. Things like the Thinkadot, there's the prototype, there's the, um, uh, the, retail, the one. retail one. Has anyone ever even heard of Thinkadot? All right, we got one person. Uh, <laughs> super, super popular in like 1965. If you were a kid in 1965, you probably would have played with one. He also made this game, the only game that really made him any money, Stay Alive. Uh, another game called Fleet House. Um, and here are some of his uh, prototypes that didn't quite make it. Wall to Wall, the puzzling, fascinating, real rug game. Fun for everyone. Um, so yeah, a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these games were actually based around computer logic, but judging from the literal hundreds of rejection letters he got from game companies, like, I'm not joking. Uh, he saved everything, and he had like 150 rejection letters. Uh, most of these games weren't very fun, and I have played wall to wall, not that great. Um, <laughs> still, he thought he had something with, with his idea about games and computers. So in 1972, actually, he built a homemade computer system. That's the system. 1970. Oh, 19, 1970. Oh, sorry. 1970. Uh, he built uh, the system 00 using just basically off-the-shelf parts. Um, he called it the Fred. Oh, here's another shot of the system 00. If you want to come to New Jersey, you can visit it in person. Um, there it is at our museum. Um, and he called the system the Fred the flexible recreational educational device, mostly because this was post RCA exiting the computer business and the word computer was verboten at RCA. So after he came up with this concept, he wanted to find a commercial home for the Fred and for that, I'll turn things over to Kevin. Uh, so yeah, he had developed this at home through 1970, uh, and he was talking about it with some of his you know, co-workers, including uh, an engineer named uh, Jerry Herzog. And Herzog suggested to him, you know, if you were able to compress this down into like uh, a single processor unit, a microprocessor, you could probably convince RCA to give this a go as a product. Uh, so they sort of were working on that at home, you know, off the clock. So once RCA went and ended the uh, its time in the mainframe business in 1971. Uh, all these computer engineers were standing around thinking what to do, and Weisbecker saw his opening. He, uh, he was in this group, he said, well, hey, I've been working on this little computer at home. Uh, you could use it to you know, play games, and you could use it for educational purposes, and maybe we should consider looking at that as a potential way to develop a microprocessor and start building out products that use it. Uh, so their boss, uh, Bob Winder, he thought that was actually a pretty good idea, and he went to uh, the managers over at the Sarnoff labs that they worked at. And uh, the manager said, uh, but we just got out of computers, are you serious? But uh, he gave him the go-ahead on the grounds that they kept it really quiet and didn't tell anyone they were working on computers, because then uh, management would come after them. So they started working on uh, the Fred, uh, the original version of the Fred, uh, which I'll bounce back here. Uh, you'll note that it has like the number pad on there. The original, original like build of it did not have that. It just had the switches. So to input anything, you had to flip these eight switches and then you pushed another switch and that was, you know, eight zeros and ones. And you had to do keep doing that until you'd input a whole program. So. One of the first things they built, uh, actually Paul Russo did, was that hex keypad. So you can actually install, or put in programs faster than that for full process. Uh, from there, they started working on uh, other approaches. They standardized the hardware and they built, I think, seven FRED units to test out stuff. Uh, one of the things they came up with was a light gun. Uh, Joe Weisbecker had been able to get his hands on a Magnavox Odyssey and the light gun for it. And he was trying to figure out how it worked, how they could use that themselves. And he actually, they actually, uh, him and the other engineers came up with a nifty idea. Uh, so the way the light gun works is that a target appears on the screen, but it's flashing at a different frequency than everything else. And the gun will look for that frequency. And if you hit that, then it counts that as a hit. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, they also came up with uh, 
some data storage uh, methods for this. So you originally you had punch cards. Those are not great. Uh, but they came up with uh, the idea of using uh, just a standard issue cassette tape player and saving them onto a tape. Uh, they, it got weirder than that. They even came up with the idea of doing this with vinyl records. And uh, you have found one vinyl record that still has program data on it in the archive. Save your things. They'll be <laughs> useful one day. So, you know, him and the other engineers, they were working on all kinds of different software for this Fred. Uh, they came up with programming languages, so you weren't just entering zeros and ones. Uh, they had some basic test programs, uh, some little screen demos, an artificial intelligence test program called Hexapon, which I have not been able to get working right. I don't know what's up there. But they came up with some games, too. So I've got a few clips of games that I've recorded off of an emulator, uh, which if you want to try any of this stuff out, uh, there's the Emma02 emulator. Look it up. Uh, the fellow who works on it, Marcel Van Tongeren, has been extremely helpful in turning these tapes into pro like binaries you can run in an emulator and then figuring out how to build the emulators for all this old hardware. So this one is Space War. This was built, this was made by uh, C.T. Wu, uh, who considers it the first action game on the thing. So you're, you're the player on the left, the computer is on the right, you're just trying to shoot each other enough times. This was me trying to figure out the controls. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really simple. Uh, so this is uh, Bowling. This was written by Joe Weisbecker, if I recall, who kept making bowling games. I think he was a bowling fan. Uh, so it's not on this clip, but uh, on some of the tapes, uh, there's actual like bowling sound effects. Like they went out to a lane and they recorded the audio. And uh, from what I've been able to turn up, the idea was that this would sync up with the uh, bowling game, and so you'd have that tape in there, you'd be bowling, you'd throw the ball, and it would play the audio clip of someone rolling a ball and hitting the pins. Uh, that has so far eluded the emulator, so it's just silent. But you get the idea. Uh, and this is Jackpot. This was the first game by uh, uh, Joe Weisbecker's daughter, Joyce, who didn't work at RCA, but she had access to all of this stuff at home because, you know, he was bringing home Fred prototypes and he was working on developing the hardware. And at some point she built a simple little uh, slot machine program. And it came from this tape. So this is the tape where the information is on. Yeah. That Marcel did a lot of good work. Yes, he did. And uh, Joyce went on to be the first woman to actually Commer develop commercially uh, available s video game software. So this is just a really interesting little uh, artifact. So this is Spot Speedway. This is a really weird game. Uh, so it's a racing game. You're the dot. You have to try and get through the course. But as you'll see, you speed up incredibly fast. So <laughs> yeah, the, uh, on the some of the memos, they have the high scores of everybody. Joyce had the highest score. It was like 236. I have no idea how she got that. I could not, for the life of me, even ground that first corner more than once. Yeah, there's the once. So, I mean, I guess. So there's this, so this is uh, one of the later Fred prototypes. Eventually they were able to start compressing the, the heart internals of the system, which were just made out of transistors. Uh, they were able to compress it down to a two chip uh, microprocessor called the 1801. This was one of the test units that they had them in. Uh, this is actually in the MAGFest Museum. Here's a more recent picture of it, it still exists. Uh, there's a few pieces of software that I think were made for this. We're still trying to figure out where they uh, came from exactly. Uh, I think that's what's coming up next here. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> so here's one of them. Uh, I apologize for the terrible sound effects. They're horrifying. So yeah, this is sort of the intro for this game. It's a uh, it's a tag game and a bowling game. Because once again, I think Joe Weisbecker really liked bowling. 
So, you know, tag is tag. You're both arrows. You try to catch the other arrow. That's, that's really it. Whoever gets the arrow gets a point. Uh, let me skip ahead to bowling. Yeah, so... Uh, it's it's based on whoever's uh, whoever's arrow is like pointed the most directly at the other player. So yeah, the bowling game it's it's an improvement on the uh, original Fred one, but it's still kind of janky. You'll note the ball just sort of bounces around. It's really hard to like plan a shot. That's that's true. Uh, so this is the other game that we found that was for that particular hardware. It's a, uh, it's called Mines on the Tape. So here are these two ships. Uh, you're flying around trying to shoot the other one. <laughs> it's a little bit space warry. Um, so you can fire the, you can fire a shot. You can also cause it to explode, or you can just drop the explosion behind you. Uh, the ex if you hit the shot or the explosion, you take damage and you your opponent gets a point. Uh, uh, the ships can go through each other and they can go through their own shots, but as you can see, they can crash into their own mines and you lose a point. Uh, you'll, you'll, so you'll, you'll see this again, this concept, sort of, on this thing. So in, 19, in late 1974, they got the idea of turning that prototype you saw into an arcade machine, and they called it the Fredotronic. Uh, this was going to be an 1801-based uh, microprocessor uh, arcade machine. This was before uh, Mirko and Midway had come out with their own microprocessor-based games. So they were on top of this about the same time that the actual games that hit retail were. So this is one of the units. Uh, this is another one. This is uh, this is sort of the, like the finalized version, quote unquote. Uh, they made six cabinets overall. And they had location tests for them. This particular shot came from the Cave Arcade that was in Feasterville, Pennsylvania. They had a mall and they had a mall arcade. This photo I think was taken by Joe Weisbecker himself who according to his daughter when they when he found out this is where they were location testing the games he packed the whole family into the car and drove there immediately and uh, like just wanted to see them in action uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out if they've been tested anywhere else uh, there's been conflicting memories on that but for sure it was at least in this one place uh, what makes these interesting on top of being, uh, you know, 1801 microprocessor based, is that they were going to be swappable. So if you're aware of the Neo Geo, how you can just swap the games in and out, uh, or how SNK did with their Micon Kit series in the late 70s, or uh, Data East did with their tapes in the early 80s, this was the same basic idea. The hardware with the 1801, that would be standard, and you could swap out little. Uh, boards, basically, daughter boards, cartridges, call it what you want, that have the actual game ROMs on them. So, again, they were ahead of the curve on this stuff. Uh, the only downs, I mean, well, you'll see the games themselves. So this is a, this is a sword fighting game that Joe Weisbecker programmed because his daughter was really into fencing. <laughs> yep, so, swords. Uh, so, you, you play a... You, it's a one or two player game. Uh, I'm playing the computer here. <laughs> so, you know, you, <laughs> yeah, you can move around the screen. You want to hit your opponent with your sword, and uh, that's how you get a point. Uh, it's, it is what it is. Uh, so here's uh, Mines again, but it's been refined. So if you're familiar with the uh, our Atari 2600 game Surround, this is basically Surround several years before that even came out. So now the ships can crash into each other. Uh, instead of firing mines, you're laying mines behind you. And uh, you can crash into your own mines, as you can see. Uh, let me flip ahead to where we'd actually figured out the controls. So yeah, this is mines. It's actually... 
Yeah, it's it's sort of like the Tron Light Cycles, if you're familiar with that. It's actually pretty decent. Of all of these, it's probably the best game. I'll say that. Uh, so this is one that they found uh, in the TCNJ collection called Scramble Split Second. It's two games. So this is... Uh, so first you're going to see Scramble. So the idea for this is that you're going to see uh, a, a symbol in the middle and you have to hit your keys on your side of the arcade machine to match that before your opponent. And then you get points. It's incredibly simple. This one, uh, I don't know if they actually location tested this one or not, but... So we'll just skip ahead to split second. This one is somehow even simpler. Uh, so in this one, it will indicate which buttons uh, you are to push, and you have to push them before your opponent. So like, push those middle three before your opponent does. This was probably me struggling with the emulator controls. And yeah, that's, that's the whole game. Uh, this is bowling yet again. Uh, this one's kind of fun, because uh, if you beat the high score, you get a free game. And it actually, unlike the rest of the games, there's more to it than like a 30 second burst of playtime. This takes a couple minutes to actually go through. That's a distinct improvement over the last version, because you can actually see where the ball is moving. And you can kind of like control it, you can push it up and down. <clears throat> Uh, it only seems to do two-player. There's no option for, like, a single-player game, so... And um, here's... Well, Chase. This is just tag again, but with the same ships from Mines. You can also play it against the computer, which just sort of flies out randomly, as you can see. It doesn't really do anything in particular. So once again, you can try all of these yourself if you want to. Uh, these are the instruction cards. Uh, these were found along with uh, a lot of the paperwork and some of these tapes at the uh, Hagley Library and Museum in Delaware, which received a lot of the uh, paper archives uh, from the David Sarnoff uh, Library. Uh, but uh, obviously the Fredotronic did not test well or else we would have heard more about it prior to a couple of years ago. So instead, they accepted that, okay, the response to this was awfully lukewarm, but what if we turned th that concept into a video game console? Uh, the 1801 had just been compressed further down into a single chip, the 1802, which was a huge deal for RCA, because they ended up making a fair amount of money off 1802s. Uh, but this would also use plug-in cartridges, like the... Uh, <clears throat> like the arcade machine would. Uh, you, instead of having, a, you know, like a joystick or anything, it would have these keypads that sort of match up with the uh, keypads on the Fred prototypes. Uh, it would have a few built-in games because that was sort of the consumer expectation at that point in 1976. Uh, you know, the games were all dedicated. You bought a console, it has the games that are on it, hardwired. That's what you got. Uh, this, you had programmable games. You could program new games. You could do what you wanted. Uh, so here's a, another one of these little uh, press photos they had. Here's people having way more fun with blackjack than you would honestly anticipate. <laughs> uh, so uh, this came out uh, on February 1977. They originally were targeting uh, to come out for Christmas of 1976, but they ran into issues with the FCC, which at the time had incredibly stringent uh, requirements for any video game console. They basically had to be shielded to hell and back so that they did not leak any uh, radio interference. Uh, so that ended up delaying them. It got pushed back to February, which they had regional launches in a few different uh, markets throughout the country. Uh, finally rolled out nationally in April. Uh, it originally launched with uh, Three games, which are uh, Space War, uh, let's see, where are the other ones? TV Schoolhouse, and Fun with Numbers. <laughs> 
Uh, Fun with Numbers is just a weird little puzzle game. It's actually not terrible. Uh, I'm really bad at it. Uh, so the games were initially programmed by Joe Weisbecker and Phil Baltzer, who was another engineer. Uh, they hired a few other people, like Andy Modla and uh, Hoytzin Vanderwall. And uh, Joe's daughter, Joyce, uh, she contracted with RCA while she was you know, on break from college and wrote a couple of games. Speedway Tag is hers and TV Schoolhouse is hers. So these were their uh, initial games. These were, well, this is all of the games that came out in the system. Uh, they came out over the course of a couple months. Tennis Squash came out in April. Baseball came out in May. Uh, the rest of them came out over the following couple of months until you got to Biorhythm at, in November. It's not really a game. It's just a weird little, I don't know what you'd call it, like pseudoscience. Uh, so here's the built-in bowling game because, you know, we've got such a thing going here. Uh, it's a lot. It looks a lot worse than the uh, arcade version. It plays slower, but it's the same basic concept. You you hit pins. So that's one of the built-in games. Uh, so this is uh, the tennis game that Andy Modler wrote. Now you're going to look at this and you're going to think, okay, it's just pong. And you're right. It is just pong using buttons instead of a paddle. But what makes this kind of unique is that uh, he decided to add English to it. Oh, that was, that was me messing up. It's okay. He added English to the ball, so it will occasionally bounce off uh, in its own direction. And that, as far as I can tell, is completely random, which is not great. But, but it's, it's, you know, it's a decent little Pong clone. Um, he also had, like, a squash game on there, which I didn't add footage of that, but it's basically you bouncing a ball against the wall. It's, you know, the same basic idea. So this is Space War. Uh, and this is a weird little, like, target shooting game. You have the missile. You want to hit the balloon. Or UFO. I'm not entirely sure what it's supposed to be. But, yeah. That's basically all there is to Space War. Uh, so, like I said, the Studio 2 uh, did not do great. Uh, so there's two reasons why it kind of struggled. The first reason is that it had much better competitors, quite frankly. Uh, Fairchild came up with their Channel F in November 76. That was a color console. It had, you know, frankly, it had better graphics. It had better audio. It had controls that weren't so, um, odd. I mean, the Channel F controls are very odd, but... But the Channel F was just a better machine, and this sort of spurred uh, RCA to push them to make a, a revision of the uh, Studio 2 that was in color and had a better sound chip, uh, other than the little beeper it has. Uh, Joe Weisbecker was apparently initially resistant to this, but eventually he agreed, and they started to work on the Studio 3. Uh, but then, in you know, 1977, August, September, Atari came out with their video computer system, the 2600, which was just a, just hands down a much better machine than either of these other two. You know, the games moved a lot quicker. They were being developed by people who knew arcade games. And they knew how to develop games. Uh, so, and the other issue that sort of a, tripped up RCA in Studio 2 here is that uh, RCA's consumer division did not care about this system and did not uh, pick it up. They thought video games were a fad, and they didn't want anything to do with it. So instead, the division of special products picked it up. What special products, you might be wondering? Uh, we're talking things like cables and antennas and parts for your radios and televisions. They were not really equipped to sell merchandise like this. Um, so units started you know, piling up. Uh, Joe Weisbecker lamented that the marketing was not uh, really there for the Studio 2, and they didn't really know how to position it. Uh, what's up? Oh. Which, wait, which, which demo are you talking about? Because there's been a few. 
Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I do have this one. I don't have okay. that one. Go ahead. Yeah, so his idea for getting RCA to pick this product up was as a way to sell more TVs, because this does not have a monitor. You have to hook it up to your television. And the idea was like, hey, uh, you buy the system, everybody would want to have this in their homes, and they wouldn't want to you know, tie up the living room TV so people would buy a whole new TV to go with, uh, to go for the computer games, and the computer or the video games. And uh, this is how Weisbecker sold it to the, uh, to the board at RCA. So he was you know, sent up to New York City to uh, Rockefeller Plaza, which was the headquarters of RCA, and he, uh, he demonstrated his System 00, that very first early 1970s computer. Uh, but when he did so, he did so on a Sony computer. And if you uh, can go back to the picture, you'll see that there's actually a Sony computer. And the story was that he, um, further back, huh? he was asked about that, like, why are you using a Sony computer and not an RCA computer? It's, well, RCA makes terrible computers, and at that time they did. Um, and you would think that my, my computer and my games were terrible if you saw them on an RCA <laughs> screen, which is why we use uh, we used a Sony. So there oh, you go, yeah, there Sony television. Sony TV. Yeah, so that's the, that's the little story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, did, they did a lot to try and uh, sell Fred on management. Uh, they made a version for Random House that you could use in classrooms to teach kids about computers. Uh, they had other uh, other interests, uh, and you'll actually I'll actually talk a little bit about some of those uh, once I get to the end of the video game portion, because uh, RCA did actually have several uh, successes with the 1802 that weren't related to computers and video games. Uh, so where were we? Uh, oh yeah. So it, they had these product cards that they put out with uh, the uh, the Studio Two. You could fill it out. You could bring it back. Uh, so in uh, February 1978, they sort of reviewed all these cards, estimated they sold between 53,000 and 64,000 units for their year, which, to give you a comparison, the 2600 came out in September and sold something like 200,000. So, yeah, they, they struggled a bit. Uh, so what ended up happening is that RCA killed the project pretty shortly after this memo went up. They liquidated all of the Studio 2 stuff to Radio Shack. And, of course, Joe Weisbecker, because he's like, well, you know, you can still use the Studio 2 for stuff, published plans on how to build your own programming cart for it that you just plug into the system and then you could use the keypads. And he was pitching it to people as a low-cost way to teach people about how to use a computer. But uh, that is not the end of the Studio 2 story, as it turns out. There was the Studio 3. Uh, the color version of it that had improved audio uh, got really far along in development before it was killed. Uh, these are some uh, screenshots off of the uh, actual TVs that they were working on these games. Uh, most of these uh, did end up coming out uh, overseas. Uh, so in April 1978, uh, RCA got approached from a company, the memos doesn't say where they're or who they are but it lists that they're from like hong kong uh about licensing the studio 3 technology and the games and selling making clones so they did that and they sold them around the world this is uh from the united kingdom uh the game there is a copy of biorhythm which was actually a studio 3 game that worked on the studio 2 so that's the other fun thing is that all the studio 3 games work on a studio 2 and vice versa it's just if you play them on a Studio 2, they look a bit nicer. So as example, here's the Studio 3 game Pinball on the Studio 2. Uh, you know, as you can see, it's black and white. You, you just have like this simple beeping noise. And on the Studio 3, it's in color. You have better sound, as you'll note once it actually starts bouncing around. 
So another instance of me trying to figure out the emulator. It's, as you can tell from the keypads, they're, they're kind of funky. Oh, there it goes. Yeah, so it's like comparable to like a Channel F. So, um, this is a Studio 3 color demo that was found on one of these tapes. So this is a nice little bit of video art trippiness. So, uh, but the Studio 3 was not the only thing they were working on. They were also working on a Studio 4 in response to the uh, Atari 2600. And this was actually going to be a fairly impressive piece of work. It was going to be more of a, a whole-on uh, personal computer. It was going to have actual joysticks. Uh, they had plans to put it out in, I believe, uh, 1979. Uh, but it got canceled mid or early 78. And this is the only program that, uh, as far as anyone knows, ever got made for it. Uh, when I talked with Andy Modla, who was sort of one of the people in charge of Studio 4 development, he said that they had a few games, like a helicopter game, that were planned, but none of it actually ever got programmed. So this is it. This is the Studio 4 demo. Also found on one of these tapes. In fact, you brought it, didn't you? Yes, it's uh, <laughs> this guy. But besides the uh, studio line, uh, they did do other stuff with the 1802. So this is a micro tutor. Uh, so this was a little device they put together in the mid-70s to teach people how to program uh, computers and sort of introduce them. Uh, Paul Russo actually talked about going around to a university, uh, yeah, Columbia University, and having to give us like a class to professors and students on how to like use the micro tutor and how to program for microprocessors because this was just brand new to uh, to computing at that point. Uh, and then there was the Cosmac VIP. Uh, this was actually uh, so this was sort of uh, the hobbyist computer like you could buy a kit and you could build it. Uh, some places sold them pre-built but uh, this came out in a uh, Around uh, August 1977, uh, it sold all right. It uh, ended up just sort of hanging on until 1980. They did produce a number of like add-on boards to it to add uh, color graphics, uh, additional audio capabilities. There's a fair number of games that came out on it. Uh, there's another VIP, the actual unit from uh, the College of New Jersey. This was a little de cute demo that uh, one of the programmers, Jeff Windsor, wrote. Uh, to sort of show how you could have a depth of field and like how you could show an animation cycle, uh, which apparently everyone was really excited about because everyone else was really bad at drawing animation. But they're like, yeah, Jeff, he's got like some background in art, art so he could make a dinosaur that looks right, or a dragon in this case. He also wrote a couple games. Here's one of them, a dog fight. I could not actually figure out the controls for this, so. But, you know, it's, it's a game. They actually put out a whole booklet of games that you could program in using, the, I think, BASIC. And this was one of the games on there. Uh, they also, Joe Weisbecker also produced uh, plans for a hobby computer called the Cosmac Elf. You could build it yourself. He published the plans for it in a, Popular Mechanics uh, in August 1976. Uh, people have built their own. Uh, you could also buy them pre-built. Uh, there's still something of a following for the Elf even today. Uh, it's actually got sort of a sort of popular to an extent. But uh, RCA did find other uses for the 1802 because it was a very hardy design. Uh, it found its way into uh, emissions control for a number of cars from uh, Chrysler, Ford, uh, Volkswagen, and Mercedes. They were all involved with RCA. Uh, it was used for international communications. Uh, so there were different telex standards in Europe and North America. So originally you had to go through this big complex uh, machine to convert them, but a 1802 could just do that in seconds. Uh, it was also used in factories. RCA used it themselves. Uh, 
for calibrating televisions uh, after it started being mass produced. Uh, originally, you had to have someone on the line to just adjust all the color guns so that the colors would come out properly on these TVs. Uh, the 1802 could set that perfectly every time in practically seconds. So, uh, and oh, they ended up using them on a couple space probes like uh, the uh, Galileo that went to Jupiter. Uh, I believe the Hubble has a couple 1802s on it. So, it. Yeah, the 1802 is radiation hardened. It was already re fairly resistant, but they did make it a little tougher. So, uh, I think uh, we go we, from here. We're going on to uh, just RCA, just making some really interesting decisions. Uh, some of them I can kind of understand, but uh, so this is uh, <coughs> this is one that they started work on. Uh, so, RCA. Uh, a couple of the engineers, Paul Russo in particular, he was working on this Intel-based DOS personal computer around 1979 that he called the Home Entertainment and Information Center. This was before IBM had put out their 5150, so which is like the first uh, personal computer on market. <coughs> they even had Bill Gates come out to uh, sort of help them develop applications for it and help them get DOS working. So they... Folks come down from Rockefeller Center in New York, the upper management, and they look at it, and the guy goes, well, we already sell televisions. We can't sell those in department stores if we're also selling this computer. So then they killed the project, and Paul Russo got really mad and left the company. Uh, do you want to talk about some of these other things? Uh, I'll quickly end up with the end of RCA. Um, so in the 80s, they decided that they were going to go into the um, movie uh, storage business, uh, just like everybody else. This is around the time that Betamax and VHS came out. But there was a third competing system called Videodisc, and uh, it was because RCA couldn't figure out how to put movies on magnetic tape. So they're like, screw it, we've been making records since 1924, we'll put a movie on a record. So this is a physically read device. You had to put it into the machine. When it ran out, you had to turn it over, put the other side in. You could also do cool things like play games on it. They made a few games that they sold. There was also a game in development that was a striptease game that as soon as upper management found out about it, they canceled it. Um, so that unfortunately did not make it to market. Um, and they put you know, all of their eggs in this one video disc basket and it was a disaster. They lost $600 million, so that's the second, uh, that's, yeah, that was that beat their previous record, and it killed RCA. A year later, uh, they were bought up by General Electric for basically nothing. And that was the end of RCA, and one of the reasons why we have such uh, great documentation, all the work that Kevin um, uncovered, was because even though the company sort of went under, they kept all of their papers. They kept them in a library in the old RCA Research Laboratory, which was later purchased by SRI International. And they kept them for years, uh, maybe not necessarily safe. They got rained on a couple of times. But they had the foresight to think that, hey, one day this is going to be interesting and important. Um, and then uh, it became a full-fledged uh, museum. So our museum at the College of New Jersey takes care of the artifacts. The Hagley Museum in Delaware, they take care of the papers for researchers, for posterity, things like that. Yeah, and uh, uh, we want to talk a little bit about the, the preservation process of some of these tapes. Um, uh, so it kind of started out with Hagley, I think. Yeah, so... Um, the, the Hagley at first, uh, somebody came and asked me if we had any tapes. I, had, I was doing a, a project on Weisbecker's games, the like paper and plastic ones, and I'm like, tapes, probably, let me dig around in the back. And sure enough, I found one tape, then I found another, and then I found another bunch. It ended up we had a hundred of these tapes. Uh, the Hagley only has... 37, I think. Yeah, so we've got far more. Um, so with the help of a lot of volunteers, not just Marcel who decoded the information, but volunteers who th did things like lend us a cassette player because the, the library did not own one, uh, figure out how to, uh, you know, kludge a cassette player into a computer so you can, you know, d uh, get the files on Audacity. 
uh, teach me how to load a uh, car uh, cassette because before I started working here on this project, I had never even used a cassette before <laughs> in my life. Um, so we, we did that process. It was a really a big learning curve for me. A lot of these tapes are old and they have come off their spools. So I had to open them up. A lot of them didn't have screws. I had to pry them open. I had to uh, re-splice the tape onto the rolls. Um, but they are all publicly available. Um, so both the Hagley and our library have made uh, the WAV files available. So you can search the Hagley. They have a big website about that. If you're interested in any of the files that we have, we don't have ours. Uh, we, they are publicly available, but you'll have to email me to get to them. But we are, uh, we're working really hard with sort of the hobbyist community to get these games out there because they do no use in a cardboard box where a person like me has no idea what to do with them. So they're a lot more fun when you can play them and you can play them on Marcel's emulator. Yeah, there's programs for the Studio 2, including a couple like prototype versions of uh, some of the released games. There's uh, VIP software, there's the arcade software, Fred software. There was, there was a lot in there and, and uh, yeah, and I should make a note, uh, Andy Modla, who was one of the RCA programmers, he actually sort of was a huge help when we first started getting this going because he was the first person to sort of figure out how to read these tapes because we digitized them. He'd actually worked on a lot of this stuff and actually used these tapes. And he's like, oh, I know the settings you need to tape to like read these properly. Uh, he put together a quick little tool to be able to convert them into uh, binary files. And Marcel developed his own tools for his emulator, but you know, between the two of them, everything has been preserved, really. Uh -huh. So uh, I guess we can open up to Q&A for the last four minutes if anyone has anything they want us to ask. Uh, so I have asked this question to people, and they've all said that it was marketing's decision to call it the Studio 2. Uh, if you note... Uh, in the, some of the prototype photos, it had the words Video Mate on it, which, I don't know, I think is a better name than Studio 2, but apparently someone decided uh, Studio 2 would be better. The best I can think of is that the Studio 1 in someone's mind was, well, okay, that's just television, right? So this is better than television. This is Studio 2. But I'm just coming up with my own off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't know the details of the of how the different chips relate to each other. experience so if you haven't seen it it's quite fun uh, yes so many so in order to digitize them I have to be listening to it and I have to monitor the software and change the levels for each and every one so I had to listen to all 95 of these tapes which are usually annoying like screechy sounds but when the bolt, because there is the bowling sound that they recorded it. And that's the worst because it's a bit louder than the actual like binary. So you'd have to like turn the volume down. And you have no idea how annoying it is to hear bowling for 30 minutes, just straight. So many, so, so many. Uh, yeah. Well, that question As, as far as I can tell from the paperwork, that was what they were trying to do with it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, 
so I don't know off the top of my head, but that's one of the things that Andy Modla, um, I consulted with him and so did the Hagley too when we were doing the initial digitizations. So I don't remember, but there is a level. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, I could do one more question while he's going there. Uh, anyone else have a question? But there was a hand in the back. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so yeah, the question was whether or not there was loss in some of the tapes. I don't know about um, sound quality. There were a couple of like, you know, you know, it's there or it's not. So unfortunately, we did have some uh, some files that uh, lost their whatever data was on them over time. Uh, we don't think that they're empty tapes because they have labels on them. So there were some, there was some loss. Um, and actually, standard archival procedures say that now is the time to start digitizing uh, these things because they will become demagnetized in the next 10 years. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a thing that lasts forever. And we did experience, unfortunately, some loss, including something from one of the Studio Fours, which was a pity because it's one of the more rare ones. Yeah. Uh, I think that's uh, it for us. Yeah. Then. Thanks so much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>